Overflow. All right, well, men, you should be awake now. That was some amazing worship. Yeah, let's give, uh, it was Becker and uh, Denny on the keyboard and then Marcos on the fiddle. Just grinding it out. Golly, that was uh, amazing, incredible. We didn't even talk about or coordinate that. That's just what the Lord does, all right? You can't take credit for any of that. That's how the Lord puts stuff together when he's bringing us here on uh, an early morning, an early Friday morning, Joseph, when we're getting early and we're counting the cost and we're, we're making the sacrifice and that we're not hitting the snooze button to wit, but we're getting our, our tails here, all right? And uh, the Lord, he brings it uh, all together with just the amazing grace and how it just flows so seamlessly um, into this overflow that Paul's talking about in the book of Philippians. Take your Bible and turn to the book of Philippians. Uh, we're going to be there. Our title this morning, God's Formula for Joyful Living. We're just going to look at four verses. It's going to be very simple, very straightforward. Um, and I want to look at verse 27. If we got that real quick, uh, Mark, Philippians 1:27, uh, verse 27 of chapter 1. It should uh, maybe come up here. Yeah, there it is. Read this along with me here. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Paul says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. The NIV says worthy. Everybody say worthy. Paul says, no matter what happens in this world, in this life, conduct yourselves worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Stand strong for Jesus. In the face of external conflicts, we have an adversary. In this world, we have turmoil and strife and fighting from within. And what Paul's going to talk about, he concludes chapter 1 with externally, when I hear about, when the world looks at and sees the way that you're living, stand firm, walk worthy of the high calling that you've received in Christ Jesus. And then he shifts his focus here in verses 1 through 4 of chapter 2 uh, to internal conflict. So just briefly, before we jump into chapter 2, flip over uh, to chapter 4 of Philippians. And uh, look at uh, chapter 4. Verses 1 and 2, and, and it just gives us some context as to why Paul now talks about these internal conflicts. Paul says in, in verse 2, and I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. There was some conflict going on. Verse 3, yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, to help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clemente and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. So basically, we have a little cat fight here in the church, all right? And, and I know just Becker talked about that, you know, the, ladies and gentlemen, there are no ladies here, so we have a little more freedom this morning, am I right, men? So basically, we had a little cat fight going on in the church at Philippi, and so Paul says, guys, we got to stop acting like this, and... and it's not just women that disagree and argue, all right? They may be, uh, we do that too, uh, men, but they may do it a little louder, a little more uh, passionately, but we have internal conflicts as well. And so Paul says, look, whether I hear about it externally, whether the adversary that you face is in the world or whether it's internally within the body of Christ, here's how I want you to conduct yourselves. And I'm just going to tell you from the outset, Mike, this message is very simple. It's very straightforward. Uh, the challenge with this message is not going to be, uh, can we understand it? It's that we're, we're going to understand it all too well. And it's going to be very simple. The question is going to be, men, are we going to live it out? Are we going to take what God is calling us to do in Philippians chapter 2 that Paul exhorted the early church to do and what he's asking us today in 2024? Are we going to take this exhortation? Are we going to take this truth of God's word for his church and are we going to live it out today? That's the question. Look at the text, Philippians 2, verses 1 and 2. It'll be on the screen behind me. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and in purpose. This uh, word, if, uh, these are first-class conditional phrases 
in the Greek, first class conditional, which basically Paul's speaking of certainty. You could sub in the word if for the word since. Everybody say since. So since you have encouragement from Christ, since you have comfort in his love, since you have fellowship with the Spirit, since you have tenderness and compassion, four uh, foundational pillars. These are what we have. This is who we are. It's the Lord whispering in our ear by his Spirit. The affection, the compassion of Jesus that he is born into, that he has imparted to us as followers of Jesus Christ, this is how we should walk, right here. And, and really the whole message today, it's going to boil down to two words. Everybody say unity, unity. and then humility. humility. Say them one more time. These first two verses are going to talk of us walking Zach in unity. So everybody say unity. Unity. And then verses 3 and 4, he's going to tell us to walk in humility. Humility should result in some behavior that's attractive to the world. Everybody say humility. Humility. So it's unity and humility. So here are just four foundational pillars. We're united with Christ. Paul says we're united with Christ. There's a oneness. There's an identity. Uh, There's comfort in his love, fellowship with the Spirit, and tenderness and compassion. When I think about being uh, united with Christ... Always think about our baptisms. You know what I mean, Hilberto? When you're up there and, and we're buried with Christ in baptism and we're raised to walk in newness of life, we're identified. There is a, a oneness, a unity in the body of Christ. And um, I just think, too, whenever, I, talk, whenever I, I think about or I read or I study and I talk about identifying with Christ, oneness with Christ, unity with Christ, I always think about suffering. I don't know if, if you guys uh, have a, a similar thought, but just suffering. And, and here today in our world, we're not called to suffer like Christ had to suffer. I always go almost immediately to Isaiah 53, and we talk about just that his body was broken. He, he was pierced. He was, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And, and we really don't have to suffer very much uh, here in 2024 in America to be a Christian, all right? You can just throw a hat on, come to Bible study, grab a donut and, and some coffee. Nathan's on his last day serving us this awesome coffee and donuts. Thank you, Nathan. We do need some more volunteers back there, like Sean said. But it's just not real hard, Pastor Elmay, to be a believer in, in modern-day 2024 America. It's getting a little more challenging, for sure, and some of our liberties are being restricted. But come on. I mean, come on, I had, a, a, I had a, an a interesting encounter in Hawaii on this trip. Again, look, here I am, you know, Mr. Joe Evangelist, pastor guy. Yeah, I'm suffering for Jesus doing missions in Hawaii. Hey, look at me, right? That should be something you should laugh at. That, that, it didn't come across quite as well as I thought, but there's no suffering in missions in Hawaii. But I'm going up and down the beach one day, I had that boot on, some of you guys have asked, and... My, my Achilles is healing up fairly well, but I wasn't quite as mobile in mid-July of 2024, uh, Elvis, just a couple months ago. And so I'm walking one day. I didn't want to go do the service project. I had three or four hours until dinner. I just said, I'm going to take my tracks. I'm going to load up my pockets. I'm just going to walk the beach and see who God brings across my path to share the gospel. So when we talk about identifying and suffering with Christ, I came up to this one guy Tall, athletic looking good, athletic, athletic looking dude, tall, thin, probably been out there surfing, doing something. He played some kind of sport, the foster, Polynesian looking dude, had his kids right there behind me. So usually when you encounter a dad with kids, it's a pretty safe space, right? As long as you don't do anything stupid. I just walked up and said hello. And the guy's like, we're good, we're good. And I'm like, Okay. And, and you guys know me, like, I, I, if anything, I love people. Like, I'm not going to just take a we're good, like, okay, adios, right? So I'm like, oh, okay, good. Hey, how's the day going? I try to, like, make some eye contact with the kids, bring them in a little bit. And, I mean, just very quickly shut me down again. Hey, we're good. And I said, and so now I'm like, okay, Lord. But again, I, 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 I want to do big things for God. I want to be extraordinary. I want to try to do something. So I, I, then I just take my, I'm taking the hints. I'm hearing what he's saying. I take the track out of my pocket and I'm like, great. All right. Um, I didn't even get his name. We'll just call him Stan for the sake of this conversation. All right, Stan. 
hey, thanks for your time. Here's just a little story that changed my life. Can I give you this track? And when I grabbed that track and I took it out of my pocket, his kids are right here. He's standing here. I'm right. He gets, he's, he said, this is the third, he goes, this is the third time I've told you. We are good. And starts getting aggressive. Now, I have a boot on, all right? I'm not going anywhere. I'm moving at a snail's pace right here, just hobbling along the beach. And, and he starts coming aggressive. I told you we're good. Is there something that I didn't communicate well? And, and the kids are right there. And I'm like, okay, okay. And I just put it back in my pocket, backed away, just head falling down, shook, unnerved, um, I don't know how else to describe it. it. It bothered me in a way deep inside that I couldn't just simply not just connect with the guy, but give the guy a gift, throw some seed that maybe the gospel, it, it bothered me big time. And so when we talk about being united with Christ, that is such a small example. And I'll tell you God, guys how God just totally redeemed that. I turn and I walk over to where uh, my man uh, Henry was playing the piano right here, or Den Denny, and I walk over and there's a family sitting there, African-American family from Maryland. It was like three generations, like a grandmother and grandfather, their kids and grandkids, and they're all running around and they're playing. And, you know, I hobble over there. There was, there was plenty of space at the table. I asked the lady, can I sit down? She said, sure, honey, have a seat. And she saw what had happened just a few feet away, and she said, are you okay? And I said, you know, honestly, I'm not. That was a tough deal. And I just shared with her a little bit of what happened. And it, God knows what you're going through. He knows everything that we're dealing. He, and she looked me right in the eyes, and I told her what had happened. And she said, Hun, she said, David, we need more men like you on this beach doing exactly what you're doing. So don't you let that, uh, yeah, praise God. Don't you let, don't you get down, don't, don't let. And then she put her hand on me and prayed an amazing prayer over me. And then I turned, and I walked, like, right where the doors are right there, from that instance, like shook, unnerved, upset. She's this godly woman of God, known Jesus, loved Jesus her whole life, praying over me, encouraging me. And then I walk, and there's two football players from the University of Hawaii, and we spent like 45 minutes, and God had been drawn, and both of these guys had, had been living kind of a life with one foot in, one foot out, but men, God had started putting, before I ever got there, men in their lives that were drawing them to Jesus, and both of these guys trusted Christ just a few minutes later. So just unbelievable how God works. But, but for me, being united with Christ, that's probably the most I'll suffer all year long, if not for the rest of my life, for the gospel. Just trying to share and having somebody aggressively, emphatically shutting me down and saying, I don't want anything. I don't want any part of your Jesus. I don't want to hear anything about your story. I don't want to know. It was that day, Jonathan, when all the Christian parades were going on. So like there was a whole lot of Jesus in this little area. And there, was peop there were people that didn't want it. So we have comfort in his love, God's love, the love of earth, 1 John 3, 16 says this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we also should lay down our lives for others. And so uh, we have comfort in his love. We rest in his love. When I think about the comfort uh, of God's love, I think about a lot of men who just need to rest in that, to stop striving, stop running, stop trying to find peace and contentment and joy in love in this world because you're never going to find it out there. The world will not love you back. You were made and designed and hardwired for a relationship with God through Jesus. That's where we find comfort. That's where we find peace. That's where we find contentment. We don't find it in career, in earnings, in jobs, in vocations, in contracts. It'll never happen. These four foundational pillars are fellowship with his spirit. 1 Corinthians uh, 6.19, Paul said it this way, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, uh, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. You have fellowship with his Spirit, the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And then lastly, this fourth pillar, tenderness and compassion. Tenderness and compassion. And if we're honest, if we went around this room this morning, men, a, a, a lot of us as men, we're not born uh, just genetically DNA with a lot of tenderness and compassion, right? It doesn't come naturally for a lot of us. And that's okay. The Holy Spirit 
births in us a capacity to have tenderness and compassion. It produces in us a love and a concern and a desire to see others in the family of God, near to God or far from God, to see others. To have, look, I I still think about that guy. I can see him right now in that story that I told you. Think about those kids with that father. What kind of life, like that, that should, that, that, it doesn't keep me up every night. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to go to that extreme, but it bothers me and I pray for that guy. I don't know his name, Julian, but God knows his name and God knows what those kids are having to walk through. That's the Holy Spirit of God. That doesn't come natural for me. It's the Holy Spirit of God. And so he says, look, these are the four. Can you put those foundational pillars back up there real quick? These are the foundational pillars that allow us to live as, as unified men of God. It's possible. It's attainable. These, this is a reality. Unity in the body of Christ is possible, men, because these four spiritual realities of what Jesus has birthed in us. And then if you look at verse 2 in, in Philippians, look at the very bottom there. It says, uh, then make my joy complete. Paul says, here's four things that I want you to do. I want you to be like-minded, have the same love, being one in spirit and one in purpose. Being like-minded. I love what, uh, what Paul said. Look, if you want to know what Paul's mindset was, you can just flip over one chapter to Philippians 3, 10. He said, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. I've heard Neil talk. This is one of Neil's life verses. As a, as a young man whose life was captured uh, there... Uh, through FCA and his dad and, 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 and living for God and that campus as a quarterback at Baylor. Neil says over and over, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. This is the mindset that God is calling us to, men, to follow the footsteps of a, of a man like Paul. Be like-minded, same love, one in spirit, one in purpose. And I uh, I've shared my testimony up here and with many of you men here. When, that when, anytime I see that word purpose, being one in spirit and purpose, um, October of 1993, I'm 21 years old, and, and a guy that I had just met the same day, Charlie, asked me two questions. What's your purpose in life and what are you living for? And at 21 years of age, I had a, a full ride scholarship to SMU. I was making good grades. I'm in the right fraternity. I'm hanging out with the right people. I'm trying to drive the right car. I'm trying to wear the right clothes. I'm trying to do everything I can to find some kind of peace, some kind of joy, some type of commitment, some type, some type of contentment. And I'm telling you, Joseph, you will never find it in this world. Don't go down that trail. Don't go down that path. It's not worth it, men. I had no purpose, no peace, no lasting joy. It was game to game, night to night, party to party, relationship to relationship. Just looking for love, the old country song says, in all the wrong places. In all the wrong places. And, it, and, and here this morning, some man needs to hear that God has a purpose, God has a plan for you, and it starts with Jesus. He's got a purpose, he has a plan for you, and he wants you to live for him. I, I, I still, at, at 51, 30 years later, I still think about, like, how did, how did, a dad, how did my dad, who, who knows the Lord, who nominally kind of walked with the Lord, how did I not have a coach, a youth minister, director, pastor, where are the men that are calling out younger men and saying, what are you doing with your life? Nathan, where are you spending your life? What are you doing? What are you, stop it. Stop running after the junk of this world. Paul says, look, be like-minded. Have this same love. Be one in spirit. Be one in purpose. Everybody say unity. Unity. This is not a hypothetical, this is not a probability or a potential. Paul says, these four foundational pillars, you have Christ, you have his love, you have the spirit, you have tenderness and compassion, so live in unity with one another. Live in unity. And then Philippians 2, 3, and 4, he says, walk in humility. Everybody say humility. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. These two verses say, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Selfish ambition. It's uh, from the Greek word where we get strife, rivalry, partisanship. 
Selfish ambition is that pride that prompts people uh, to push their own way and their own agenda. That's what selfish ambition is. And vain conceit is the arrogance. It's thinking more highly of oneself. It's excessive self-interest. It's excessive self-preoccupation. Vain glory. Empty glory is, is literally what that word means. It's chasing after stuff that will never satisfy, that will only leave you empty and longing for more. It's, it's what drove this, these two women, Euodia and Syntyche, to, to a cat fight in chapter 4. And surely there were others in the church that, that, that evidently uh, self-centered, selfishness, uh, self-glory, uh, bipartisan uh, agenda, they were going after all for themselves. And Paul is looking into the situation at this church that he loves, that he led people to Christ and he discipled them and he's saying, stop it. Just stop it. The practical application, I brought along just three quick bullet points and um, this is how Paul says each of you should live your life. He says, be unselfish, be humble, be focused on others. Read those after me. We're going to start at the top of the list. Uh, the top of the list. I'm going to say the B part, and then you read the second letter. You ready? The second word. You ready? B. Unselfish. B. Humble. B. Focus on others. That was really good. Let's give yourselves two claps this morning. Wait, 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 wait. On three. You ready? One, two, three. <laughs> be unselfish. Be humble. Be focused on others. That's what Paul this encouragement is for us. So being unselfish, let's just break these three down really quick. How do we do it? What does it look like? The problem is we're all hardwired when we come out of the womb selfish. We all, it's our second nature. We put ourselves on the throne. We have this lens, uh, Sean, where we look at everything in our life, this little grid or this lens of how does what I'm going through today, how is this next meeting, how does this uh, uh, social event, how does this afternoon, how does it affect me? We're all asking, how does it affect me? And so the challenge in living unselfishly is removing that lens and, and figuring out how to ask the question and be okay with the fact that it's not about me. It's not about me. That's a part of that uh, great book that uh, Rick Warren wrote. It's like second all-time best-selling, The Purpose Driven Life, behind the Bible. Uh, the, the first five or six, the very first words of the whole book are, it's not about you. This life is not about you. It's stuck with me forever. I haven't read that book in... 20 years. But, he t but, but, but the, I think the secret sauce behind it is, is, is encouraging men and encouraging women, followers of Jesus Christ, to realize that our life in Jesus is not about us. It's not about you, Charlie. It's not about me. And, and that's a hard thing to accept because everything that we've done, everything that we're accustomed to, everything that we walk through, Al, in life prior to Jesus, it's all about me. It was all about me. At 21 years old, listening to what my purpose was, well, my purpose is to, to go out with the hottest girls, find, uh, consume as much alcohol as I can, have as much fun as I possibly can. My purpose was to just party and have great hedonists to eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow I die. I didn't have any clue. It was all about me. And Paul says, do nothing. Be done with it unselfishness and then he says to be humble and the word humility literally means lowliness of mind it's esteeming others more valuable than yourself humility is the virtue that every child of God every son of God should strive for humility uh, I've heard it said it's often hard to articulate humility is hard to articulate it's hard to define but it's unmistakable when you see it it's unmistakable. We could go around this room, and every one of you men would have somebody in your mind's eye right now, even as I'm talking, you're thinking about somebody that walks in humility, somebody that's unselfish, somebody because humility is what allows us to be focused on others. Humility is what gives us the power, the strength, the desire to live unselfishly. Humility is at the core of this entire point of application. When we 
uh, walk in humility. There's never a moment, men, when we're more like our Savior. And conversely, we are never more like our adversary than when we're full of pride and ego and self-centeredness. I'm going to say that one more time. We are never more like our Savior than when we walk in humility. And we are never more like the devil, our adversary, than when we walk in pride and ego and self-centeredness. Jesus made it clear all through the Gospels. He said in, in Matthew 20, 26 through 28, he said uh, the, 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 the officials, the Gentile officials, they exercise authority over you. They lord it over you. Um, but he said, not so with you. He said instead, verse 26, if you want to be great, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Everybody say servant. Jesus said, be a servant. He said, whoever wants to be first must be the very last. Everybody say last. That's humility. You get at the end of the line today, Joseph. If there's an opportunity to get in a line or form a line, get yourself at the end of the line. And say, I'm going to let everybody else, uh, Zach, today, over at PCA, set yourself apart. Make a decision today to get at the very back of the line. And I promise you, identifying with Jesus and being at the end of the line, that's greatness. And you're not going to hear this from the world. I hope you're hearing it from your dad. I hope you're hearing it here from Neil Jeffrey. I hope you're hearing it somewhere because it ain't coming from the world. Amen? It's not. It's not coming from the world. Be a servant. He says, uh, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He said in Luke 9, 23 to 25, if any man would come after him, he must deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. He said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit or lose his very soul? Lay down your life. Give it away. Men, that's the problem with this text this morning. It's so simple. It's so clear. It's so straightforward. We can't help but understand it. The question is, are we going to go live this today? Are we going to walk in unity? And are we going to humbly walk this out being focused <clears throat> on others. We got to see others, men. We have to open our eyes and look around. And the, the first and most obvious encouragement is to take your eyes off of yourself. That's what Paul's saying. You got to take your eyes off of yourself to see the people that are all around you, to, to, to slow down, to stop trying to be so busy, Hiddle, and knocking out your to-do list. Slow down. Maybe you get half the list done today. Maybe you do two things instead of four. I feel like you could get more than four done today. But maybe if it's only two, and then you, you, you encourage someone. You stop and pray for someone. How rare is it today? Men, I mean, what kind of an impact could the men of Prestonwood Church have today if we just resolved to do one thing today? I'm going to find one person in my path today as I go out. As I go out, as I leave here, I'm going to find one person that I pray with. That you have a, a, a meaningful conversation. It doesn't have to be 45 or 50 minutes, an hour. Take five minutes. Look in someone's eyes. Ask them questions about themselves. Take your eyes off yourself. Ask them some questions. What are they pursuing? What are they dreaming about? What are they interested in? What are they going after? And then say, hey, that sounds amazing. Thank you for sharing that with me. Can I pray for you? I want you to do this. I want you to accomplish that. If every man in this room, a couple hundred men, just made, it in, made a decision today, right now, before we leave, we're going to pray for someone. We're going to lay a hand on and we're going to audibly, out loud, pray for someone today. Look around. Be done with vanity, arrogance, self-centeredness, self-preoccupation. The high-minded self-absorption and the greater concern, it inhibits our ability to see others. When we're so concerned, so consumed, and we're so preoccupied with ourselves, we don't even see the people that God has put all around us and right in our path throughout this day. Be unselfish, men. Be humble. Be focused on others. This is the simple application. And in closing... The problem, I said it before and I'll say it again with this passage, is not that we don't understand it. The problem is we do understand it. And we know exactly what it means. That God's called us to unity, to love one another, to be like-minded, one faith, one hope, one purpose, one love. 
And Paul was so passionate about it because he knew that the early church, the only hope they had was that the world around them would look at them and say, and they did, they looked at them and they said, wow, how, how they love one another, the manner in which they love one another. I want some of that. I don't understand it, I can't explain it, but what they have, I want it. And that's the kind of men God's calling us to be today. That's the challenge. We know exactly what it means. We've got to walk in humility. We've got to be unified with one another. You see, Paul, I feel like he's kind of like a coach in a locker room. And he's looking around his team right now. This is our locker room here this morning. I'm looking at every one of you men. And I'm going to ask you the same question I feel like Paul's asking us right here in the book of Philippians to the church of Philippi. He's saying, you say you love Jesus. Everybody nod your head. You say you love Jesus. Okay. And you say you love me, Paul's saying. You say you love Jesus. He's saying, you say you love me. Do you really? Do you really? And if you do, if so, let's get our act together. He's telling the early church, stop, stop bickering. Stop fighting. Stop all this nonsense. You say you love Jesus. You say you love me. Let's go act like it. Life is short. Eternity is long. Let's play the long game. Life is short. Finite number of days. Just a little bitty blip in all of eternity. And your soul, the souls of men and women everywhere, will last forever. Let's play the long game. Get your head up. Get your eyes on Jesus. Let's play the long game. What lasts forever? I'm going to try to tell it every time I stand up. Or what are the things 500 years from now? What are the things, Cochran, a thousand years from now that are going to matter? My relationship with God, his word, and the souls of men and women. When I was 21 years old, praise God, I had a man who told me that simple truth. Don't waste your life, shivers on the junk of this world. Don't waste your life, Hilberto, on the junk of this world. There's three things that last forever. My relationship with God, his word, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Everybody say forever. Forever and ever. Get your mind off of yourself and let's play the long game, man. Let's put our mind on that which lasts forever. We're a divided nation. So many fronts. It's an election year. There's toil war, there's strife, there's fighting, there's bickering everywhere around us. The world says, kill. I mean, my gosh, we've seen it already. A, a presidential candidate assass- assassinated attempt twice. We got to be different. We got to be different. Not so in the church. It's like this in the world. It's not going to be like this in the church. It's exactly what Paul's saying. Be unified, like minded. The same love, fellowship with the Spirit. Now live this out. Be unselfish. Be humble. Be focused on others. Everybody say unity. unity. Humility. Humility. First John 3.16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. So we also should lay down our lives for one another. Amen? Amen. All right, I got some questions for you guys to talk about at your tables right here. Pick whichever one you want. One, do all three, whatever, and I'll come back and close this in just a moment. Go.
All right, men, let's go to our uh, knees really quickly and pray. Sorry to interrupt this uh, <clears throat> good dialogue and conversation this morning. Heavenly Father, we love you, and uh, we thank you, uh, Father, for the gift of your son, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for this encouragement from your word this morning. We thank you, uh, Father, for our church, and uh, Father, for the pleasure and the privilege of knowing you and walking in fellowship with you. Uh, Father, use us uh, today, and whether it be uh, just through a word of encouragement, a smile, uh, a kind, a word aptly spoken in a moment, Father, of need uh, in the life of someone, Father, that you bring across our path. I pray that we would slow down and be open and unselfish and focused on others today, Lord, and that our humility would be evident to all that you bring across our path. And uh, Lord, we'll give you all the praise and all the glory for that. We pray, uh, Lord, <clears throat> for our families of all the men represented here and uh, for the opportunity this weekend again. Uh, to worship you in spirit and in truth uh, here and at churches all over our town, our city, our state, our nation. Uh, Father God, uh, help us to stand apart. I said it earlier and I say it again, Lord. I pray that uh, people would see in us a love uh, that is extraordinary, uh, that is sacrificial and that moves us uh, to unselfishness and that it moves us to meet people where they are and, uh, Father, to love them and encourage them and to tell them uh, that there's nothing special in and of ourselves, that it's Jesus, nothing more, nothing less. It's Jesus, Jesus, and Jesus. That's what we need. We need more Jesus every day, Lord. And, uh, Father, we want to honor him and make much of him in all that we do. Uh, this is our prayer. Use us for your glory. Help us, uh, Lord, uh, to pray, uh, to encourage, and to, to touch those that you bring across our path today, and we'll give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. And all God's men said, amen. Amen. See you next week, gentlemen.